Well, before I forget, just to say, Lindsay sends her love. Uh, she's at our own church this morning, and uh, they are likewise. Oh no, they're not specifically doing part of something, they're doing something as part of an Easter series. Um, but, of course, uh, for those of you who support Coventry City, and uh, who very kindly decided to remind me of your allegiance, uh, following their uh, destruction of Wolves last week in the Cup. I suppose the only consolations I wasn't here last Sunday morning, which would have been worse. But uh, I, the, the, the team obviously came back to Coventry in a triumphal entry into the city, down Jimmy Hill Way to the uh, CBS Arena. But in that triumphal entry, there's one thing missing. Where was the donkey? They actually left him at Molyneux. He was actually playing for Wolves, the guy who should have got sent off for that kick, of course, Nelson Semedo. But talking of donkey kicks, of course, I, I don't know if you've been told the, the legend of the donkey kick free kick. Oh, you know about it. Obviously, the older Coventry fans will know. And who was it who executed that unique once-only donkey kick free kick? Willie Carr and the guy who scored? Ernie Hunt. Brilliant bit of improvisation, but of course Willie Carr went on to win the League Cup with Wolves. And I was there for, I was there for his debut, a 7 1 win over Chelsea, when he scored a scorching 25 yards into the top corner. I think that was about the sixth goal or something. So, yes, I, I thought I'd just say that and let you have your moment of glory. But can those people who've come in Coventry City shirts please see me afterwards? Um, so I can have a selfie uh, and I can send it to Bob. And say to him, can you please speak to these cruel people at, uh, at APEC about their behaviour? Uh, but also you know, to send it to a few folks to say, look, this, this is what I've had to, to uh, go through this morning. Uh, but no, it's, it's good fun. But uh, actually, uh, we've a little bit of trivia there from the country city, but uh, another bit of trivia. Uh, does anybody know the title of the shortest ever? Number one in the UK charts. Anybody got any idea what it is? No idea? It's if. Anyone remember who it was by? Well done, Telly Savannah. Do you even know the year, Dave? 1975. Telly Savannah was an actor famous particularly for uh, portraying the US detective Kojak. And he released. Well. <laughs> You can't put it as a song, you just actually sing it in the talk. Uh, maybe it's an early version of a sort of reverse of rap, uh, because instead of speaking at incredible speed, he spoke incredibly slowly. And it sounded something like this If a picture could paint a thousand words, then why can't I paint you? Anyway, <laughs> uh, to say, If a face could launch a thousand battleships, then why can't I? No, I was going to say, Why can't I launch you? No, that wasn't the words. But, uh, it was that, that title, If. And actually, when I read from the, as I'm going to now, from the New International Version uh, from Luke's Gospel, uh, in my version, and you might want to listen to this, the word if occurs three times. And I want to focus on those three ifs this morning. Um, these are of far more value, of course, than the. Uh, <laughs> dare I say drivel that Telly Savalas spoke in that uh, and it, it, if you see the video of it it's even worse you see if it is smoking he's, 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 he's speaking these words and there's this huge uh, woman's face on the screen behind him but one version of it is it's a bit weird uh, but there we go but in chapter 19 now I've spoken on Palm Sunday twice before here and uh, the first time I think I spoke from Mark's Gospel the last one was from Matthew's Gospel, so on. let's go for a different one this time. It's Luke or John, we're going with Luke's account. So Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through to, I'm actually going to read through to verse 44. And so this is the original Palm Sunday, if you like. So verse 28, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. 
those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks at the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near to the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So I hope you spotted the three ifs. So we've got verse 31, if anyone asks you. And then we've got verse 40, if they keep quiet. And then verse 42, if you had only known. So if anyone asks you. So here we've got Jesus He's ready to enter Jerusalem in what we call the, this triumphal entry. Oh, by the way, if you were here for the walkthrough, let's see if you can remember the, the hand sign. What do we do for triumphal entry? They all forgot it. We got on our donkey, didn't we? It was triumphal entry. Okay, and then temple cleansing, which is the verses after the ones I read. Uh, but, yeah, then we got this triumphal entry. And it's from a hill called the Mount of Olives. So this is on the east side of Jerusalem. About, uh, well, the Bethany itself, a couple of miles outside Jerusalem. Bethphage, very close to Bethany. And then you've got the Mount of Olives. And there is on the east side of Jerusalem. He sends these two disciples to this village ahead of them, Bethphage. And they've just got to go and get this cult and tie it. Uh, you know, the equivalent might be you going to, uh, some, so to where you see, let's say, a Range Rover parked, and you just go and keys happen to be there, so just get to the Range Rover and drive off with it. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, that's the equivalent of what they're doing. But, he says, if anyone asks you why you went to tell him the Lord needs it. So, they go, and they find this cult, and Matthew and, I think it's Mark, gives a bit more detail, so you've got uh, the, the mother of the cult, you've got this donkey and its cult there, and they're to untie them and take them. Luke just focuses on Cult. And of course, people see them take it, you know, it's, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, it's, oi, that's not yours. Like if you tried to do that with somebody's Range Rover, oi, what are you doing? Uh, you can always try the line, the Lord needs it, and see what happens. <laughs> but I suspect you might not get such a good reaction as here, where these uh, people say, oh, okay, hey, fine. Now, whether Jesus had visited them beforehand, and spoken to them and said, okay, so I'm going to send a couple of my guys and they're going to untie your cult and you say to them, uh, why are you untying it? And the password is, the Lord needs it. And then you'll know that they've been sent by me. Whether he did that, I don't know. Whether this is his supernatural authority and they just, on the spur of the moment, say, oh, okay, the Lord needs it. That's fine. But either way, we see his authority. If anyone asks you, Reminds me of the story, I'm sure it's not true, of these two uh, undercover police officers who went to this farm. And they said to the farmer, We're uh, doing a search of farms in the area, and we're going to search your farm to make sure that there are no illegal drugs being grown or harvested or stored here. And uh, he said, Okay, then that's fine. And he said, Don't go in that field over there. And one of them, got very cross, he pulled his badge out and he said, you see this badge? He said, I have all the authority of the government behind me. 
This badge says I can go anywhere I want, I can search anywhere I want, no questions asked, no answers given. Do I make myself clear? My father nodded politely and went off and was on, on, just started doing his chores. When a few minutes later he heard this, these screams as he dropped his tools and ran to where they were coming from, which was this field that told them not to go into. And there was his bull chasing these two officers. And of course it was gaining on them. So he quickly shouted to them, Your badges! Show them! Show them your badges! But of course, the bull didn't recognise their authority. And yet here we have this cult that has never been written recognises the authority of Jesus. He doesn't try to throw it off its back. And these owners, of course, recognise the authority of Jesus. And we see on other occasions authority over nature. The disciples have fished all night. They've caught nothing. And he says to them, throw your nets over the other side of the boat. And they, they can barely bring all the fish in that are so His authority over nature. The time when um, they were there was this uh, discussion about whether Jesus was paying his taxes. So he says to Peter, go and catch a fish. What's in his mouth? I can't wait for the tax. And so here is one who has supreme authority. And he cannot be denied the obedience that he is due. And he will have that obedience. And the challenge for us this morning is this. Will you, will I, willing? Submit to his authority. You see, there's a day coming when every knee will bow before him and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what it says in Philippians chapter 2. And we either willingly bow to his authority now in this life, which those of us who are believers gladly do, we don't feel it's a, a burden, we don't feel that it's it's, it's forced. He didn't force that on us. But if you don't do it in this life, you'll do it in the next. And for those who don't do it in this life, that heralds an eternity away from him. Whereas for those who do it in this life, it's an eternity of serving our Lord. And that's a wonderful prospect. So if anyone else to you. That if brings out his authority. But then there's this next if. And it comes as they're on route to Jerusalem. So we've got the, the uh, cult that's brought along. And, and by the way, it is something in Jewish tradition that suggests that uh, only someone who is holy could ride a cult that has never been ridden. But also you see the um, idea of riding a donkey, there is a hint in the Old Testament, more than hints in places, that this is something kings did. You read of um, Absalom when he organised this coup against his father David and usurps the throne. We read of him riding his mule or donkey uh, when he gets his hair caught in the tree, which leads to him being uh, executed. And so he's riding a donkey. We read of David riding, well, not riding a donkey, so we read of him when he's worried about another coup right at the end of his life. And so he quickly decides, before he's uh, reached the end of his life, he needs to make sure his son, his chosen successor Solomon, is anointed as the next king of Israel. And so he says to um, the high priest and, and other key servants, he says, uh, get my you, my donkey, and put my son Solomon on it. You see, that was his own personal donkey. Nobody else would have written it. But he's saying, no, this is going to signify that Solomon is king. And so it's a triumphal procession as Solomon is declared king. And then in terms of casting their cloaks on the ground, we see that with Jehu, king of the northern kingdom of Israel. When he's announced king, they, they cover these steps with cloaks as they're going to declare him king. So all of this says Jesus is the king, the cloaks, and the fact he's riding on his own donkey, because it's his own in the sense that no one has ever ridden on it before. He is clearly sending out this message, I am the king. I am the king. And they, they then have crowds coming 
out of Jerusalem because they're there for the festival of, of Passover. John tells us the crowds came out of Jerusalem to meet him. You've got his disciples coming with, with him and they sort of converge and then they all go towards Jerusalem. But then we see that there's a point at which, and this is presumably as Jerusalem first comes into sight in verse 37, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices. So maybe it's the sight of Jerusalem stirs them to think, yes, he's coming to take up his rule and reign from the capital, Jerusalem. And they praised God in loud voices for all the miracles they'd seen. And maybe they kept thinking, this miracle worker has the power to raise the dead. It's not that long before this he's raised Lazarus. So he's got the power to defeat and kick out the Romans and we will be free. And so they start to praise God in these loud voices. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. So they recognize he is the king sent with God's authority. And they say, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now that first phrase, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, is from Psalm 118. But the second phrase sounds very much like what the angels said when they announced to the shepherds the birth of Jesus, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And here comes this king who is the prince of peace. But we see the Pharisees, the religious conservatives, who were very much into their rules and regulations, they don't like this at all. And their attitude is, you need to tell these people, I've told them to be quiet. How dare they be saying all this? Because they do not accept that Jesus is the king of the Jews. Of course, uh, a few days later, Pilate's going to rub their noses in it when he puts that plaque on the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Which they really, they really riled about it. And so they are very unhappy about this. How dare he be received this praise? He just a man as far as they're concerned. Of course, we know he was more than just a man. He is God the Son. He is the Son of Man, which is a divine title. And so, they are pouring scorn on all this. Now, sadly, that's what religious people tend to do. That they don't like you to get too excited about Jesus. Because for them, it's all about, and by religious, I mean those who have a sort of empty religion. And it could be a Christianity. Uh, and so for them, it's all about rules. You've got to do this, you've got to do that to earn God's favour. It's all about rituals. But really, it's all about relationship with the true God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And okay, if rules and rituals help you to, uh, in some way, to, to worship the Lord, well, there's a place for them. But all too often they get in the way. It's all about all keeping the rules. Or you know, this person mustn't get too excited about Jesus. Um, so it, it's it's really something that that is so sadly true of those who don't truly know Jesus. Of course we should get excited about him. Of course we should sing his praise. Why we've been doing singing those wonderful songs, you know, Hosanna in the highest, echoing what isn't mentioned actually in Luke's Gospel. Uh, Luke doesn't mention that, but Matthew and Mark mention the fact that the, the crowd also shows to Hosanna. Hosanna. And actually, Luke probably didn't write that because Luke is really writing for a Gentile audience. And for them, Hosanna to the son of David. What's that all about? Hosanna, what's that mean? Well, it means save, or God save us. And echoed what happened uh, about oh, 100 uh, no, yeah, about 160 or so years before when the Jews managed to rebel against Greek rule and uh, got rid of Greek rule from the land under the leadership of Judas Maccabeus and they had this uh, shouting of Hosanna and waving of palm branches so again it's this sort of messianic idea but Hosanna is the son of David well for a Gentile in those days What's that all about? Well, David was the uh, greatest king of Israel, and Jesus is a direct descendant of David. So, that 
wants his earthly claim to kingship. But they tell him to be quiet. And what does he say? If, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. You see, Jesus can't be denied the praise he's due. He can't be denied the obedience he's due. And he can't be denied the praise he's due. And we will have a wonderful eternity, not only serve him, but praise him, worshipping him. And we get a foretaste of this in Revelation chapter 4, when the scene is heaven. And we've got these living creatures and these elders, and they fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before their feet and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And so the challenge for, for us today, for you and for me, is this. Will you, will I, give praise to him? We've been doing it in song as a congregation, haven't we, this morning? about when we're on our own? Do we still give him the praise as Jew? What about when things are tough? When the rubber hits the road? Do we still give him the praise as Jew? In Hebrews chapter 13, the writer is writing to some Christians who are being persecuted. He refers to that persecution on various occasions. But he talks about offering the sacrifice of praise to God continually. And for them, it was a sacrifice. There are Christians today who may well suffer for being Christians because Palm Sunday and Easter, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, are occasions when some of those in, in certain countries who hate Christians will pick up that there have been some awful events where Christians have been attacked and killed on, on these key uh, dates. And for them, it's a sacrifice. If they praise the Lord publicly, they run the risk of persecution, maybe even death, just as those Hebrews did. And we praise the Lord in that situation. But if we keep quiet, stop to cry out. Because Jesus can't be denied the praise is due. But then we come to him approaching Jerusalem, he gets a bit nearer. Maybe now the temple's coming to view. I don't know, but we see him weeping over this. He's grieved. And he says, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. You see, they're thinking peace in terms of the Romans being kicked out. We rule ourselves. Self-rule. No Romans. That's peace. And here's the one who's going to bring us that peace, this triumphant king. But they've completely misunderstood the reason for this first coming. And so, he says, if only you know what will bring you peace. What's going to bring the peace is him dying on the cross for them. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah is prophecy about the uh, coming crucifixion hundreds of years before. He says that he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. And then he goes on to say um, that in verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions, our sins, where we've broken God's law. He was crushed for our iniquities, for punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, so on the cross, he experienced God's judgment and punishment against sin. Our sins, in a sense, were nailed into the cross. And he died for us. And that's the only way to have peace with God. And it's not just an absence of hostility. It's this shalom, this wholeness, this fullness, this whole myriad of blessings that comes from knowing your sins are forgiven, knowing peace with God, knowing God is your Father, knowing Jesus is your Lord and Saviour. 
And the only way that can be is through Jesus' death on the cross. We can't pay for our own sins. Because we have fallen short of God's glorious standard. It needed one who's perfect to pay the price for us. And that was Jesus in his death on the cross. A punishment that brings us peace to God the Father. And so, Jesus knows what's going to bring that peace. But sadly, many of them are going to reject him. They're going to say, away with him. We won't have this man to reign over us. Just five days later, on Good Friday, that's their attitude. They don't know what's going to bring that peace. It's hidden from their eyes, sadly. And he warns them of the consequences of this. And these verses, verses 43 to 44, seem to be prophetic of the fall of Jerusalem to the Romans in AD 70. Yes, the Romans already controlled the country, but there was an uprising against the Romans, which was brutally put down by the Romans in AD 70, and many Jews died. And it seemed that that was God's judgment on Jerusalem for the rejection of his Messiah. For saying, oh wait, we won't have this man to reign over us. They wanted self-rule for the Romans. And now today there are lots of people who in effect, even if they wouldn't say it publicly, they're in effect saying in their hearts, away with him, we will not have this man to reign over us. The, the answer to our peace is self-rule, doing what we want, how we want, when we want it. Never mind what God says in his word, never mind what his word declares. And so, they won't bow the knee, not in this life, to Jesus as their Lord. They won't repent of their sins and say, God, you're right. I'm wrong. They don't want to submit to his rule. And yet the irony of it is, when people say, I don't want anyone reigning over me, I want to determine my own way, it's an illusion. Because the Bible makes it clear that we all are under rule. It might be under rule from sin, but ultimately Satan. Or it's under rule from God. Ultimately, it's one or the other. And so choose who you're going to serve. Be like Joshua who said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But you see, as the events of AD 70 show, and as events at the end of the age will show, Jesus can't be denied the justice that he is due. And so it says in Acts chapter 17, that there's going to be a day in which God will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. So that identifies the judge as Jesus, or is it? That he is going to execute judgment. And it's simply a question of whether we have submitted to him as our Lord and Saviour or whether we haven't. Whether your name is written in his book, the Lamb's Book of Life, it's called, or whether it's not. And that's whether you're going to say, I don't want to reign over you. Or whether you're going to say, yes, I willingly submit to his reign, his rule, as my Lord and my Saviour, as I confess my sins to him. Now, those people there, he says in verse 44, he says to them, You did not recognize the time of God's coming to see. You see, he came into his own, his own didn't receive it, John Pitt tells us. And here he is, God the Son. And they don't recognize he was God the Son. They didn't recognize God had come to them, that the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among them. Among us. And I wonder, will you recognize this morning the time of God's coming? to save you. Because he is speaking to you this morning through his word and through his Holy Spirit. But do you recognize it? Do you recognize your need of Jesus as your Lord and Savior? So we've got these three ifs here. If anyone asks you, if we keep quiet, if you don't need 
which highlight that the first if that Jesus can't be denied the obedience he is due, and that he can't be denied the praise he is due, and that he can't be denied the justice that he is due. Now, I'm going to give you a, an invitation to accept him as your Lord and Saviour. To tell him that you want to willingly submit to his Lordship. You want to bow the knee to him this morning. You want your sins forgiven. That you are telling him, I'm wrong, I'm sorry, you're right, I want to serve you. And for those of us who know him, to, to have that opportunity to say, praise you more. Uh, I want to obey you more. I want to worship you more. And so, could you all stand please? And if you want to make Jesus your Lord and Saviour this morning, then I'm going to invite you to do that. And the way you do that is by praying. You don't have to do it out loud, you can do it quietly in your own heart. That's, that's uh, simple enough, because he knows your thoughts, he knows what's in your heart, and he knows how genuine your heart is. And if you want to become part of his family, then all you need to do is to tell him you're sorry for your sin, tell him Jesus, he died on the cross for your sin, and tell him you're going to submit to him as your Lord. So, just perhaps you might close your eyes, just bow your head. So if you want to do that, just tell him now that you are sorry that you have sinned against him and that you're sorry that he had to pay for your sins on the cross. In your own words, just tell him that now. And then thank him for dying on the cross for you in your place. If you see, just tell him how grateful you are that can hear a voice. And then tell him that you want him to be the king and lord of your life, but that you need his help to follow him. And if you've done that today for the first time, then you've received him as your Lord and Saviour. And the Bible says that as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. So you're part of his family given of your sins, guaranteed the joy of spending eternity with him. So if you've done that, well, people say, well, well, we've got our heads back, just raise your hand so we can uh, I praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And so please speak to me or somebody else afterwards to just find out more about this new life in Christ. And for all of us, let's just spend a moment or two in silence, just letting God do business with us and speaking to us and responding to what we've heard this morning. So Lord Jesus, thank you so much. You are the King. And that one day you will reign as King of Kings. But our desire is for you to be King of our hearts even now. Forgive us for the times when we 
do, even as Christians, forget that and go our own way. Help us to be more faithful and more honoring. And for those who've made a, a commitment to follow you as their Lord and Savior this morning, that you'd help them to go on in that for your glory and praise. Because we want you, Lord Jesus, to have a more glory and praise. Amen. Okay, let's have our final song, please. And then I'll uh, have one final prayer. And this is Praise is Rising. Eyes are turning to you. And uh, in 